Batman experience. Batman experience. Batman experience. Batman experience. Experience. Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience, presented by Underdog Fantasy. Code Mayo at Underdog Fantasy right now will give you a first-time deposit match of up to one hundred dollars, which could really come in handy. With the UFL starting, because it's happening, the XFL and USFL have merged into one. There's daily fantasy games for it, and Underdog is going to have fantasy player prop pickums available to everyone who lives in a state where you can play pickup. Of course, you know, not the ones where you can't do it, but the ones where you can do it. And those are really the lines that we want to beat up earlier on in the year. I've had the most success that I've had at any point during Fantasy Pick'em games, during both the XFL and USFL, the first two seasons that ran from like weeks one through six. And then they started normalizing their numbers and they got a little bit better on the Pick'em side. But if we can beat them up early... You know, we're going to be looking pretty good for the entire year. Plus, DraftKings has 50K up top to a tournament. So I had to bring in the minds who actually do follow this stuff and actually have the strategy and have been very, very successful at doing it. First up, my partner in crime at runthesims.com, the one who was scouting depth charts, They're trying to look over the fence in like Birmingham to see who's actually getting snaps on the field. It is Justin Freeman. What's going on, man? Oh, uh, I'm so glad to not be doing that this year, Pat. Uh, but, you know, I miss the days where you could go out and just grind your edge the old-fashioned way. Uh, Cody Main from EstablishTheRun.com also joining us. This is your time of year, isn't it? This is. Justin and I are sworn to celibacy. We, we will not be interacting with our family whatsoever for the next 10 to 12 weeks. And, you know, hopefully, like Justin said, we can grind out our edges the old-fashioned way. I, you know, I love these leagues. And I think part of the reason why is we we feel like we can grind out an information edge and you kind of feel like this parental role here as as guys like Justin and myself trying to grow this thing a little bit organically, trying to get people into the circus tent that is spring football. Well, before we dig into like the plays of the week, because obviously we don't have the underdog pick numbers out yet. They're expected to be released either very late on Thursday evening or sometime on Friday afternoon. So, you know, first come, first serve on those kind of things. But you hit on the key thing here, Cody, information edge. Can you, can you think of a daily fantasy sport where there is such a large gap between people playing it and the information that some people know and the other information that just no one has a clue about? Yeah, this is definitely the one. I mean, look, when when we talk about NFL, NBA, PGA reporting has its own issues as far as injury stuff goes and swing changes. But but as far as sports go, there isn't one that I can think of where uh, you know, people like Justin and myself who are trying to bring our subscribers and, and people that are following us information. I can't think of a bigger gap between the, the casual UFL fan and somebody who is grinding this thing day in and day out because you don't have the traditional media reporting. There isn't an Adam Schefter tweeting out transactions. There isn't uh, injury reports even sometimes for these leagues. So you are looking at a serious information gap. And if you know if, if you look at stuff that I feel like I've had success in in the past, it is those sports where I feel like you can grind a little bit harder, try to find the information gap, NFL preseason, XFL, USFL now all combining into the UFL. It is it is a seriously good opportunity. And like you said, Pat, early on, underdog, when you're looking for pick I feel like if you've been putting in the time in the offseason, reading up on things, you'll have an, a little bit of an edge over, over even the books who are trying to set these lines. Well, Justin, I've watched like 30 seconds of all of these leagues combined over the last two years, and I've walked away a big winner because you've been running the projections at runthesims.com. Code Mayo will get you a 10% discount. I highly recommend that you go do it because this is like a weird niche part of the year where we can really excel based off your projections. So what do you think the best time to look at the projections are? Because there is this information edge, but... As we were kind of talking about a little bit before the show, like one reporter can say one thing and then everyone's whole ecosystem is thrown out of whack of who's even playing in these games. Yeah, the hive mind effect is real in these leagues because we're so freaking starved for information that we will grasp a hold of anything we can get our hands on. Um, and it goes around the echo chamber. But no, it's it's always a good time to be sort of keeping up to date with the lines. Um, part of the way we do things at Run the Sims, obviously, is um, you know, we have we have tools designed to help beat these pick'em sites. So the moment they drop lines, we're refreshing our sims to say, hey, how often is this guy going over or under this number? So we want to we want to hop on that right out of the gate because 
Uh, sickos like Cody and myself are going to be hammering those lines as soon as they are released. And so if we see a prop lines off by 25 yards, it's not going to stay that way for very long. So um, good reason to hop in Discord of your you know, side of choice and make sure that you're up to date on when those lines are getting posted because uh, they will get normalized. And it's not to say you can't also uh, find value a little bit later in the week. Um, and we're going to try to make sure that uh, our subscribers have a good feel of where those opportunities lie. Um, but overall, like you do want to have uh, a chance at that first mover advantage, which, which is really helpful. Yeah. So the, the way that I like to utilize things over at Run the Sims is one, like once the underdog tool and the pick'em tools are ready to go, once those numbers are loaded, you can compare to that and see what, you know, what the simulation say that the number is, the percentage winner time, and then you can calculate your EV based on that. Or even if you don't have that and you do want to go prep for it, what I like to do is to jump into the actual DraftKings showdown simulator where you have the single game, and then you can actually see what the projections are on each of the players as it stands right now. How often do you find that the projections change from like we're recording this on a Thursday, first game is on Saturday, I believe that it is. Like, do you yeah. find that like, I mean, in the NFL, projections can change up to like an hour before the game when you see inactives how much do you find that like ufl stuff is probably going to change justin yeah we'll be modifying our stuff on a very similar frequency um if not more often especially this first week like we're really reacting to every single piece of news that we get our hands on like there's just so little of it out there that um, if we get even a, a morsel of information from from any source, particularly from the team sources, and Cody and I can talk a little bit about depth charts and <laughs> whether they have merit or not when they come from the league. But um, typically, there's a little bit of signal in some of these, um, but it's also kind of put together by like the uh, the intern uh, for the you know Uf USFL stallions or whatever. But uh, yeah, overall, it's better than whatever we had beforehand, right? So uh, th there's at least some reason to adjust. So yeah. I'd say like, don't build your lineups right this second uh, on DraftKings, but do feel free to go ahead and hammer uh, those lines on the pick'em sites as soon as they become available. So Cody, what do we need to know about the UFL? How many teams? Where are these teams? Who's the favorite? What are the good offenses, at least in your predictions? Yeah, there's there's a lot to get get familiarized with, but I think if you've been around the last couple of seasons, and even if you haven't been, at least you've been you know, tangentially familiar with what's been going on in spring football. The USFL and the XFL decided to merge this this winter. They've created the UFL. There are four teams kept from the USFL conf that will make up the USFL conference, four teams from the XFL that will make up the XFL conference. Those brands are the Memphis Showboats, the DC Defenders, the Houston Roughnecks, which were formerly the Houston Gamblers, the Arlington Renegades, St. Louis Battlehawks, Michigan Panthers, Birmingham Stallions, and the San Antonio Brahmas. They they kept some pretty damn good offenses, and I think the teams that that did not have good offenses in past iterations of spring football brought in some new coaching staffs, combined with this kind of culmination of talent being now condensed into eight teams that was once across 16 teams. I think we're going to actually see some pretty good offenses here. The one that I'm most excited about, I think the team that, that might be, in, in, and maybe Justin and I can go back and forth on this, but I think the team that might uh, or should be the, the week one favorite on sports books to win the entire thing is the St. Louis Battlehawks. Return their head coach, their offensive coordinator, their quarterback, who is A.J. McCarron, a nucleus of skill position guys that I think makes them probably one of the best, one of the most explosive offenses in the league. Did some damage in the dispersal draft in January, adding a few pieces to the defensive side of the ball that I think really shored up a few things for them. So for my money, and you can find some good numbers out there, on the legal sports books to win the UFL championship in 2024. I think the St. Louis Battlehawks are one of the best, most well-rounded teams. And then that's, so they're from the XFL conference. Uh, on the other side, we've got back-to-back -back champs returning for a third season in the Birmingham Stallions. I think uh, just based off of the way the USFL conference is set up with their four teams, they have to be considered the favorites to come out of that side as well. But I think overall, if you're looking to watch, if you're looking to wager, and if you're looking to play on DraftKings or pick em sites like Underdog, going to be a lot of fun offenses this year, I think. Yeah, Justin, was there any offense that stood out to you as like, oh, this offense is terrible? Like, we, we really just want to actively avoid this one. 
I think there's a few potential landmines out there. Um, you never really know until you see the the quarterbacks tried out. But I kind of have circled on on my uh, radar here, Michigan and Houston as being probably the two biggest liabilities offensively. Uh, of course, like if, if they get great quarterback play, that can all change in an instant. We've seen terrible teams in the XFL previously not stay terrible forever once they found consistent quarterback play. But uh, EJ Perry will be the quarterback for the Michigan Panthers, uh, at least presumably as of right now. Um, and then when you look around the rest of that team, just I don't see a ton of high upside. And I think mostly this is um, me making a claim against uh, EJ Perry and my ability for him to command that offense more so than it is uh, the supporting cast. There's a couple names I do like. Former Philadelphia stars, Matt Colburn, Devin Gray, um, Jordan Sewell are on that team as well. Uh, guys who I have liked historically. And Wes Hills, who was a uh, very high volume rusher <laughs> last year. So are these just like Madden creative player names for you, Pat? You're just like, what are we talking about? <laughs> no, because I, I played the deal like the DraftKings slate every single week. I was playing Pick'em every single week, but I was just looking at the projections. I, I all I remember is Wes Hillis was at one point projected to have like 35 touches in a game. And I can't remember yeah. if he's the guy who just randomly didn't play one of the games. I, I don't recall, but that would not, <laughs> that would not surprise me. There, there yes. was, there was one week when everyone was on this one running back that was supposed to absolutely light it up. It's like, cause there's only like two volume running backs in the entire league, or at least there was, yeah. maybe that's changed, but it was one week where like, Oh, this was like the value play. He's going to get all the touches and just, he was inactive and no one told anyone. That, yep, that sounds about me. right. Par for the course. Yep. So quarterback wise, we kind of went through. So it seems like St. Louis is the one to gravitate around. I'm sure that people are going to know that maybe fade Houston and fade. Uh, who is it? Houston and Michigan, Michigan were the two, Justin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cody, you would pile on and say that's probably right. Yeah, this isn't a good sign because we're already reaching week one consensus here. I would have <laughs> I would have pointed out those two teams as well. I think there are a few reasons to be maybe a little bit more bullish or at least accept a wider range of outcomes for the Michigan Panthers. But I think it's it's largely league wide consensus that the Houston Roughnecks will likely have the worst offense in the league. So, Cody, running back wise, there's only one running back slot on DraftKings. Uh, you can play, there's two flex spots. I mean, overall, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven spots. You do need a defense. You do need a quarterback. You need a running back, but there's no solo wide receiver spot. It's wide receiver or tight end, wide receiver or tight end. There's no solo tight end spot either. So, the receiving players are grouped into one. There's two spots for that, then two overall flexes that you can play anyone that's not a defense or a quarterback in those. Are there running backs right Right now that you can point to to be like hey these guys are actual bell cows right now and maybe there's not one on every single team but maybe there are two or three like around the league yeah i think there are a few that are going to stand out particularly in week one the the biggest one that stands out to me is dc defenders they were the xfl's run heaviest team last season they ran at a 55 percent clip this is offensive coordinator fred kais's mo even dating back to college he wants to run the ball they're kind of one of those old school Hard nose, establish it on the offensive side of the ball. They have Greg Williams uh, coordinating the defense, so they want to blitz a punch on the defensive side of the ball. So they really want to smack you in the mouth quite a bit, and I think they're going to continue that. Although Abram Smith, their bell cow from last season, went down with an ACL injury in training camp, what it sounds like is Cameron Harris is going to step up as the bell cow in D.C. I think he's going to get the first crack at the RB1 role and, and be one of those guys that maybe we can't, we can't project 20-plus touches for but going to be an RB1 in a run-heavy offense that, particularly in Week 1, is six-point favorites against the San Antonio Brahma. So I think that's kind of where my my heart gravitates towards first is, is Cameron Harris. And then as you look around the rest of the league, there's going to be, you know, not necessarily full-blown running back by committees, but I think there are going to be a bunch of two-man backfields in the UFL. And a lot of that's just because there's a lot of, there's a lot of backfield talent, not a lot of guys that are going to separate in a big way. Going back to the Stallions, though, C.J. Marable is their running back, presumed to be their running back one, has been with the team for now his third season, entering 2024. They lost both Scarborough to retirement last se uh, this season, although he didn't play a bunch last year. They lost Aquandre White, who was with the team last year as well. They've got some talented backs, including Larry Roundtree, who was with the Chargers for a few seasons, and Ricky Person Jr., who lit it up with uh, in limited sample with the USFL Stallions last year. But I think CJ Marable is going to get a, a good crack at a bunch of opportunities, both as a runner and a receiver starting as week in week one. So I think there's, there's a few backs to look forward to 
But I do think there are going to be a few more like RB1A slash RB1B type situations in this league than, than we've seen in the past. So with Harris and Maribel, Justin, uh, what do you think we can add a name onto that? Or do you think those are the two and then everyone is probably like a tier down, at least where we stand in week one? Yeah, the only guy who I'd maybe toss in there just based on track record alone is Wes Hills. Uh, just in, if he can continue to be this volume-based rusher that we're expecting him to be, then he'll be right there in the mix. Um, and we're, we're kind of like got our first piece of news of the week, which is we're waiting on Mark Thompson's uh, injury availability. He's a guy we've seen get a ton of carries when he's healthy. But given the fact that he's at best probably going to be wearing a Q tag this week, there's probably better, more secure options for us to, to dive into. So yeah, I think that's a good that's a good group to start with um we've seen a lot of these players before which is kind of comforting uh I, I would also add uh wayne gallman to that list uh he, he'll be the presumably uh number one running back for st louis um it's just going to kind of depend on how they decide to deploy uh their personnel there and whether they will lean on wayne gallman the way they've leaned on brian hill in past years um, so like that's a fun offense to be a part of and you sort of hit your wagon to. So th there's, you know, there's kind of upside cases for all these guys. So what I'm trying to do is just let's, let's make sure we, uh, you know, check all this and kind of flatten our exposures out across the board. Yeah. Why? Well, so is that the way that you would want to play it here, uh, in terms of running back, like where we don't know that maybe it's best to stack up an offense or even just, you know, a mini stack of another offense and just mm -hmm. kind of rotate through running backs. Cody, it's a lot like what I do in DFS golf, where, especially like in a week where we're just having right now, where everyone wants to play Scotty Scheffler and they do want to pair him with one of these very top end guys. Well, that means you need to go diving in a dumpster for the bottom end of your lineup instead of really committing yourself to three guys for three lineups in the five thousand or six thousand dollar range i basically just built a whole bunch of lineups with the two studs that i wanted and then just rotated in through a bunch of just loser players and hopefully i got lucky yeah exactly right and i mean you can make a case for a bunch of these guys i think this is a position particularly in week one when we don't know a whole lot to to try and flatten your exposure as justin said I don't look at the board and think uh, of one guy that just stands out to me as a slam dunk home run running back this week. We'll wait on the news for Mark Thompson. If he is out, presumably TJ Pledger would be in play as one of those guys who could get up there in terms of his touch volume. Um, Harris stands out to me again, like I said, but, but I kind of agree with Justin that I don't want to hitch my wagon to one particular guy this week. I think there are a handful of guys that can provide a valuable score at running back, but not one particular guy that I think could run away at the position. Strategy-wise, Justin, with the one running back spot, do you ever anticipate playing two running backs in a lineup? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's plenty of reason to play as many as three running backs, particularly early in the season where we're trying to jam in some projectable volume. A lot of times what will happen is if you lean really receiver heavy, you can essentially over leverage your team because we we don't really know where the ball's going anywhere in the offense. But at least when you can narrow it down to one of three different running backs for a particular team, you can feel pretty good that your guy's going to at least put something on the board. So uh, running backs definitely kind of like the high floor play. And I think mixing in a lot of high floor options in week one specifically makes sense. The, the problem is we've seen like running back scoring be pretty capped and the the real spike week scoring comes from the receiver position so you, you do have to sort of blend that floor and ceiling uh which i know that's kind of like a non-answer but overall like yeah I, I think there are builds where having extra running backs makes sense there's builds where extra receivers make sense um i i think you want to try to try to pick your pick your spots accordingly so that you can uh, i guess not have too much risk in your portfolio yeah, so I'm just looking at the uh, run the Sims right now in terms of what we're seeing on the screen in terms of I just generated some optimized lineups. So it's a, I'm guessing, Justin, but with your numbers right now, TJ Pledger, you have as the actual starter right now? We do. Yeah, exactly. We have uh, Mark Thompson projected out right now. So Pledger getting the bulk of that work, which I mean, we're even hearing words that his theoretical backup could be more of a guy. Who knows? Uh, and coat. <laughs> Cody, to, to take a look at it, the, the optimizer is spitting out Chase Garbers as the, the main quarterback in the first six highest projected lineups. Yeah, actually, I'd be remiss if we didn't mention Chase Garbers before we move on here, because I am uh, probably one of the biggest San Antonio Brahmas bulls there is out there. Uh, if you remember from XFL 2023, A.J. Smith, Wade Phillips, and the Houston Roughnecks coaching staff 
has moved to San Antonio. They now are in charge of the San Antonio Brahmas. Brahmas was a, a, a bad team, frankly, last season. A bad offense, not an exciting offense, a team that ran the ball way too much. They they injected a ton of uh, offensive firepower into that, and that starts with Chase Garbers, who was named the QB1 this offseason after competing with Quentin Dormady, who was the former Orlando Guardians quarterback. But head, uh, offensive coordinator A.J. Smith had some glowing things to say about Chase Garbers. He actually uh, referred to him and compared, compared him to Houston Roughnecks quarterback of 2020, P.J. Walker. Anyone that is a true XFL OG from 2020 knows that MVP J Walker it was the real deal. And so getting any sort of comparison there between Garbers and someone as good in the XFL as PJ Walker is serious praise. I'm excited for the San Antonio Brahmas offense. The books have clearly not caught up to it that, that there's this influx of talent and this change in coaching staff because the Brahmas have like the worst odds to win the USFL championship this season. But I do think that they're going to be a much improved offense. Uh, you're going to see a ton of dropbacks from Chase Garbers. Agree with Justin and Ron the Sims that he should be the the optimal quarterback or one of the optimal quarterbacks this week, just based off of projectable volume. You can project him for 100% of the snaps. This the San Antonio team is going to drop back a ton. And then when you get into the the offensive weaponry that they have, they've got a ton of talent in in their skill position core as well. A lot of speed, a lot of size, and I think that combination is going to be phenomenal for. Chase Garbers in the Brahmas offense. Yeah, and San Antonio opens as six-point dogs this week, so presumably they're going to throw more often than not, uh, unless they're just so very poorly coached and run the ball 35 times, down 35 points, which I don't think is out of the realm of possibility in the UFL, just to make really mind-boggling yeah. decisions. But I'm just looking at some of the stacks, Justin, that we can bring up here with Garbers. So the, the highest projected one is going to be Garbers with Cody Latimer. Shout out Cody Latimer. He's back. And... John Trey Kirkland would probably be the best one. That's expensive, though. It's, it's a little expensive, but salaries mean nothing here in week one. So this is uh, it just go go find your bargain bin guy that's cheap and and don't think about it again. Like you you, you could definitely pay up for the guys you want uh, in in UFL for sure. So yeah, John Trey Kirkland balled out. Like he was probably on his way to being like a legit MVP candidate last year before he got hurt. Um, a guy who looked like he has quite a bit of sizzle. So, um, like a speedster, he, he plays like more of an outside role, I believe, but just like gets down the field, lifts the roof off, just, um, subject. Like if Garbers has a big day, Kirkland's probably a big part of that. And Latimer, Latimer's technically a tight end, um, but he's going to play kind of all over the formation, I think, for this team. So, um, yeah, they'll, they'll both be on the field together. I think that's, you know, think of it like as a premium double or something like that. I think it's it's well worth paying for. So, Cody, do when we build and construct the DraftKings lineups, like my just default thought was like, all right, who's a dog in one of these games with a little bit of a higher total? Can I grab a quarterback and two receivers or a tight end or just two pass catching options? Is that the way to think about constructing these lineups, do you think? Or is it just fine to have a quarterback with one pass catcher? Or do we need to have two good pass catchers, maybe like the loser pass catcher at no money whatsoever to save all your money? Is there a defined strategy to this that we can realize right now or are we still kind of a work in progress yeah not to take a cop-out answer but it is one of those things that i think we should take on a, a slate by slate and even in this case like a team by team basis there are certain quarterbacks and certain offenses that i think would require a double stack like in order for the quarterback to go off he's going to need to he's going to need to support two pass catchers there are other offenses where maybe we've got a a, a more run centric offense or a, a quarterback that has some rushing ability of his own where I think you can single stack or even even trot him out there naked. Uh, go back to that D.C. defenders example. Jordan Tiamu is a quarterback that I think you could pair up with just one pass catcher or even in some instances run him out naked just based off of his own rushing ability and his ability to find the end zone with his legs. So I do think it's something you need to think about on a team-by-team -team basis. For most of these teams, though, uh, just, just given the, the pass-centric nature, I suspect from this league and the pass-centric nature from a lot of these teams, St. Louis being one of them, San Antonio being another, uh, it, usually if those guys, if those quarterbacks are going to go off, they're going to bring two of their pass catchers with them. And in a lot of cases, it's going to necessitate a bring back. You're looking at kind of a, a similar basic construction that you would think of from, from kind of an NFL main slate, a shorter NFL main slate, of course, with only four games. But uh, again, you can take that on a case by case basis, and there will certainly be times where you don't need to force a stack and definitely don't need to force a bring back. So I'm just going to plug in the tools again now. So I'll go quarterback, 
from San Antonio with a bring back from the DC side. Is there any strategy to picking defenses, Justin, or just kind of roll with whoever's left? Uh, yeah, I like to avoid um, defenses that are a part of my stack, whether that be the same team as my quarterback or oppo team as my quarterback, and just try to pick one from the six remaining teams that are that are out there for sure. All right. So, yeah, so it gives us kind of the same thing where we have Chase Garvers, Kirkland, and Latimer as the primary stack from the San Antonio side of the ball, Cody. But then it gives us Kiki Cutie. There we are. He's one of mm-hmm. the receivers you can use. Cam Ron Harris at running back. Uh, and then it you know kind of mixes out some of the receivers. But those seem to be the, the two big stacks with the two big bringbacks. Would you say that's probably pretty accurate? Yeah, agree. I think that the the Chase Garbers double is going to be a, a, a popular one, and for very good reason. Finding the bring back is going to be difficult. I think Kiki Kute is going to be a popular guy just based off of, of pedigree. And which, knowing, which is kind I, of I know his say. name. That has to help. <laughs> Casual fans know his name. Uh, there's some NFL experience, like legitimate NFL production, regular season NFL production, not just preseason production. And the defenders lost their top three receivers from last season, vacate almost 70% of their targets from 2023. So we're looking for somebody like QT to step to step in. We think he will, but there are all there are also some cheaper guys that could potentially step up. Brandon Smith was with the team last season. He's a big body target who could play on the outside. Chris Rowland is a former Philadelphia star. He could be a, a guy that lines up in the slot a little bit, could be one of those shorter area A dot type guys that could rack up PPR volume, which is good on DraftKings, of course. So I, I think there's a plenty of ways to play it. If you're going for the premium stack, of course, Cameron Harris as the running back from that team is going to be good, a team that likes to run a lot. And then on the, the receiver side, I think the premium wide receiver who we feel most confident in is probably QT. Yeah, so I think I'd rather go with the running back angle on that one, Justin. You mentioned uh, Jordan Tamu, Cody. Justin, are there any other running quarterbacks that we should be aware of, or is it just really Tuamu? Uh, there's there's your sneaky group of runners as well. Um, but yeah, it, it can go a lot of different ways. We, we saw Case Cookus, believe it or not, like as a traditional pocket passer, show quite a bit of uh, rushing upside throughout pieces of the last two seasons. Uh, it'd be interesting to see how he looks. And then Chase Garber is a guy who we saw uh, run quite a bit in his college career. So would not be surprised to see that. We're still kind of waiting to get confirmation on what the Birmingham Stallions quarterback situation is going to look like. We currently have it as Matt Corral. Um, and we're giving him quite a bit of rushing upside as well. As well, But, um, you know, what a sort of word of caution here as you're thinking about constructing stacks Don't be surprised to see platoons at quarterback, especially in week one, like from a full blown 50 50 committee to like, uh, you know, red zone packages a la Taysom Hill with the Saints. Um, There's a wide range of outcomes for every single one of these guys. So, Cody, if we're just talking platoon quarterbacks that we maybe don't want to go down that route for some of our main lineups, or even if we're trying to hit on uh, pickums and over unders in terms of passing yards and, you know, if you start taking guys out for 30% of their snaps, it's just going to be harder to hit a lot of those totals. Who are the solidified, these are the quarterbacks? I'm guessing it's A.J. McCarron is like far and away number one. A.J. McCarron far and away number one. I, I suspect as long as he stays healthy, A.J. McCarron is never going to come off the field. That's that's a huge benefit to him. He is the guy that if you're playing a cash game contest on DraftKings, you know you're going to get 100% of the opportunities for him. Um, kind of going down the list, I think we feel pretty good. I feel pretty good about Chase Garbers. I think just the specific verbiage used by both head coach Wade Phillips and offensive coordinator A.J. Smith, to, to compare him to arguably the best quarterback that the, the spring football leagues have ever seen, pretty high praise. I think Chase Garbers is going to have a pretty long leash for the San Antonio Brahmas. And then you go to the Renegades. Uh, Luis Perez was a guy that came in like week six, week seven via trade last season. Average 7.9 yards per attempt, completed a bunch of his passes, and then they go on to win the XFL championship. I think he's damn near 100% of the team snaps, pretty close to locked in, not going to come off the field no matter what. And then you do get into some those situations. Justin mentioned the Stallions. We don't know who the starting quarterback is yet. Could see something as crazy as 50-50 there or something as wild as 100% Matt Corral and no Jamar Smith. The Panthers, we are expecting EJ Perry, although that has not been announced yet. So that could be another platoon situation between EJ Perry and Danny Etling. The Houston Roughnecks, Jarrett Gorantano. We know he's going to start, but head coach Curtis Johnson has already said that the quarterback two will play at least a series in week one. So there's a full-blown 
platoon situation there. You could see Nolan Henderson or Reed Sinet play as much as a quarter, I think. Uh, and then the defenders. We like Jordan Tamu. Jordan Tamu is going to project really well simply because of his team total, because of his rushing upside, because of his efficiency. But we are expecting Jalen McClendon and or DeAndre Francois to play a little bit. They offer a, a, a little bit more dynamic rushing ability. So I think those guys will see the field some. Uh, and then for the Memphis Showboats, Case Kokis, another guy that I think is close to 100%. But I mean, we're, we're Thursday of uh, a week one, and we still don't know if he's going to be the actual starter. We assume he is. He's listed as a captain, so I would be surprised if he wasn't. Uh, but it's not yet been confirmed. So you're really looking at maybe two or three quarterbacks where you feel really, really good about them playing 100% of the snaps. And then the rest of the guys, you kind of have some question marks. Well, I think that's really important. Like, how is that baked into projections, Justin? Obviously, we can go in and you can set it any way that you want if I want to go run them myself. But <clears throat> when we think about the pick'em sites and when yardage is posted for these, do you think just blind unders on a lot of them, if it does look like that wasn't factored in? Like, they're just like, hey, Jordan Tamau, yep, he's going to play 100% of the snaps. Like, well, maybe that's not so much the maybe, case. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, I, I think I'm typically looking to own, exclusively play unders in week one if the lines come out anywhere near where I would expect them to come out. Um, what we've seen uh, from pick'em sites in the past in terms of where those lines, uh, how they've typically looked. So I, I want no reason to play an over because too many things can go wrong, it's particularly in week one. So it's not like I'm going blind unders across the board, but I am kind of filtering to exclusively unders as I'm making my slips because like as you mentioned, there's just so many paths to um to getting there with the under i mean you have your the unders are like typically even good bets on the nfl side if you were to take those blindly uh on player props uh much less here in the in the ufl where we literally know absolutely nothing and um you, you get a chance for even like guys further down the depth chart to to start taking away some real opportunities. Yeah, it would strike me as a thing where if the main quarterback got platooned Cody and then the new guy came in and looked great for a series, they'd probably keep rolling with him, wouldn't they? That's one thing I'm concerned about with Jarrett Quarantano in, in Houston. Named the starter, seems like they're pretty safe with him, but, but but what if he struggles for a quarter and then Nolan Henderson comes in in quarter two, leads a touchdown drive? Are we suddenly then looking at a full-blown 50-50 split there? I agree with Justin and like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go crazy adjusting our projections at establish the run after seeing pick them lines on underdog. But if I see that we, we project an over to be pretty strong in week one, I'm going to seriously look at our projections and see what possibly is going on here. Because I, I generally agree that unders are going to be your safest bets in week one. And, and frankly, for a couple of weeks until we have some certainty with the data that we're working with. Last two things. Are there any pass catching running backs, Justin, that you think that we can mix in with quarterback stacks? Yeah, I think mixing your quarterback um, with your running back is still a viable strategy uh, in, in this brand of DFS. Um, as I look around at running backs that are going to have a pretty strong uh, pass catching volume. Um, as long as Mark Thompson is out for the Roughnecks, I like TJ Pledger to be involved in the passing game. Um, and then also Wes Hills, uh, we mentioned him being just sort of a workhorse. If if that continues and he just stays on the field all the time, like I think you can certainly pair him up now that we're super excited to use his quarterback there. And then, um, but uh, from the Brahma's standpoint, we've certainly seen A.J. Smith use pass catching running backs. Uh, Max Borgie last year was the guy for the Houston Roughnecks. Uh, and this year, it's going to be some combination of the three running backs they have on the roster, which are Anthony McFarland, a name that Steeler fans will remember, uh, Bryson Aline and John Lovett, a guy who played decently well down the stretch for the Vipers last year. But uh, overall, like I, I think you don't want to go down too far down the running back depth chart, I don't think. Uh, so sticking with McFarland and hoping that he can be sort of the primary rushing and receiving back. Uh, is it would be a smart way to pair him up with the with the Brahma's quarterback. Well, the thing that we need to know, who are the guys that we're playing who no one else is playing, Cody, and are super cheap so we can make all these lineups work? Yeah, it's interesting. I haven't had a chance to run our ownership projections yet. And and now that I'm hearing Justin talk, I think there's consensus on a few things. So I think there there might be some spots where ownership does get blown out in a big way. Certainly keep an eye on that as we get a little bit closer to lock. 
uh, I'm going to use the word and a phrase that I've used a lot with spring football in the past is cautious optimism that Marquez Stevenson flies a little bit under the radar as the presumptive slot receiver in the San Antonio Brahma's offense. I believe he's 5,800, a guy that was taken by the Bills in the sixth round of the NFL draft, uh, has been on IR, been on PUP, a guy that never really felt like he got healthy in the NFL and got a chance. But you, you're you hearing glowing reports from both Wade Phillips and A.J. Smith referred to as what they think is one of the fastest players in the league. And I think he's going to play a very important slot role in A.J. Smith's offense. A.J. Smith loves to go four wide. So the way I see it, John, Ch- John Trey Kirkland on one side, Justin Smith on the other side, or some rotating cast of characters on the other side. And then you have Cody Latimer and Marquez Stevenson who can both play in the slot. Cody Latimer, a guy that played 80% of his snaps, from the slot last season, give me Marquez Stevenson, a guy that that maybe is a four four type burner in this league. We've seen guys with just physical traits win, whether it's with size or with speed, and I think he can win at this level. I, I just uh, I hope he doesn't get too too carried away in terms of his his actual ownership. So the other ones that I'm looking at right now, based off the projections being spit out, Justin, looks like DeAndre Overton at thirty six hundred dollars is a decent points per dollar guy. Yep, uh, he's a guy that we've seen in spring football in the past. Um, has has a pretty uh, strong track record for delivering um, and across the middle of the field. So yeah, definitely a guy who grades out well points per dollar. Um, then also you get into some of the tight ends like Jay Sternberger, um, who's going to have like a, a mega role I think uh, there for the Stallions. He's priced at sixty one hundred, so it kind of gives you some exposure to that middle area. And uh, you know, there's a few guys that were in the NFL last year that I think could possibly you know we want to leave a light on kirk merritt was a guy played for the saints uh, and dolphins over the last couple of years um he, he's going to be like a running back receiver hybrid type for houston he's 4700 um so he's going to grade out pretty well but then also don't forget about sal canella at 5500 oh. like t- tons of projectable volume for that guy spring football hall of famer maybe at this point <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he. I just I just know him from there because you mentioned you always like kind of go with the unders and pick them, except for Sal Canella because he's gonna have like <laughs> seven for ninety five every single week. Yeah, <laughs> it works out pretty well for my guy. <laughs> All right, well, I mean, I think that's a good primer for the UFL season week one. Again, code Mayo at runthesims dot com will get you ten percent off all the projections when the pick em numbers come out. We'll have the pick em optimizer uh, to see how you know often that these ones win. Cody, what do you guys got going on at ETR for all of spring yeah. football? Normal spring football content for us. I just ran uh, through a first pass of week one projections, uh, ran through a first pass of week one top plays. We have constantly updating depth charts with notes. A lot of the stuff that Justin and I just talked about here today, you can find in in kind of an all-in-one type research center on our depth charts page. So check out Run the Sims, check out Establish the Run as well. Justin and I are just here to, to try and grow spring football DFS. I think we are both uh, hopelessly obsessed with this league and these types of leagues and really just want to see it succeed more than anything. Justin, any final thoughts that maybe something we didn't get to that you wanted to bring up? Yeah, no, that's it. I, I think Cody and I try to come up with our stuff in a vacuum. So it's a tad bit disappointing when we come out with the exact same results because it's always kind of nice to just kind of let it ride and see what happens heading into week one. And uh, he works hard. I work hard. Uh, our, our team and his team are, are both working kind of around the clock trying to scour stuff. But yeah, if, if you're into like actually picking up an edge in DFS, which is theoretically what we're all here to do, like no better time to hop into spring football, trust the process, uh, pounce on some unders it's a good time let's have some fun well that will do it on the pat mayo experience once again code mayo at underdog fantasy will get you a first time match deposit of up to 100 dollars. just hit the link down in the description and you better believe i'm going to be tweeting out my entry slips which you can just either tail or you can fade them if you really want to but this one actually if you want to fade the pga stuff any college basketball stuff you see me put out or nba you know i'm just listening to other people on this one i'm going to listen to the projections for ufl and it works so well the past two years that uh, i think you want to going to want to test the waters at least a little bit maybe i'm going full hog in week one maybe you want to be a little bit pensive this is just how i go at some of these pick em things and you can do that on underdog and the sports books just probably aren't going to have player props available for you to go at so underdog's really the only place where you can get down action on this and i would highly recommend that you do it i mean you can win a bet right away by going to underdog using code mayo depositing 100 bucks boom 
another hundred bucks just shows up in your account. I mean, you double your money right away. It's better than winning a 50-50, right? And you can use all the tools that run The Sims for the DraftKings optimizer, the Showdown optimizer. All the tools are up there based on the simulations that Justin is running with the projection. So I highly recommend that you go do that right now again. Code Mayo at runthesims.com. Thank you all for watching. Hopefully they run contests in week two. And we'll see you then. Hey!